Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can analyze the Kitty Genovese case and the bystander effect. This murder case is one of the most well-known in the world of counselor education and related fields like social work and psychology because it is said to illustrate what is referred to as the bystander effect. This is the idea that when a crime is witnessed by multiple people, the probability that one or more will intervene is lower than if there were just a single witness. That's not all this case is known for. It also contributed significantly to the establishment of the national emergency number in the United States, 911. Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I'll put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. So here I'll be looking at the background of both the killer and the victim, the timeline of the crime, the investigation and the trial, then I'll take a look at the bystander effect. So starting with the background, first the killer. Winston Mosley was born on March 2, 1935. At the time of the murder in 1964, he lived in South Ozone Park, Queens, New York, in a single family home. He was married with three children, he had no criminal record, and he worked for a company that made business machines. Now moving to the victim, Catherine Susan Genovese, who is also known as Kitty Genovese, was born in Brooklyn, New York on July 7, 1935. She graduated high school in 1953. Shortly after this, her mother witnessed a murder and her family moved to Connecticut, but Kitty moved in with her grandparents in Brooklyn. She would get married in 1954, only to have that marriage annulled within a few months. After this, Kitty moved to an apartment in Brooklyn and eventually worked as a bartender. She was arrested for participating in a bookmaking operation and was fired. She then went to work for another bar, eventually functioning as the manager. About 10 years later, she would move into an apartment in Queens with her girlfriend, Mary Ann Zialonko. Now looking at the timeline of the crime, March 13, 1964, about 2.30, a.m. Kitty left work and made her way home driving a red Fiat. She was stopped at a traffic light when Winston Mosley saw her from his parked car, a white Corvair. He followed Kitty home. At 3.15 a.m. she parked her car in a parking lot about 100 feet from the door of her apartment. She was making her way to the apartment complex when Mosley, who was armed with a knife, stepped out of his vehicle and started following her. Kitty then started running toward the front of the building and Mosley pursued her. After he caught up with her, he stabbed her twice in the back. She cried out, indicating that she had been stabbed, and she asked for help. One of her neighbors, named Robert Moser, shouted, leave that girl alone. Mosley heard this, and he ran to his vehicle. A few other neighbors saw the attack, and they heard Kitty cry for help, but nobody did anything at this point. Kitty then made her way toward the rear door of the building, entering a vestibule. That's where she was when Mosley returned 10 minutes later. He was now wearing a hat, I guess to make himself look different. He looked around a train station that was nearby, the parking lot and the apartment complex, until he eventually found Kitty. She was lying in that hallway I talked about toward the back of the apartment building, unable to enter the building because of a locked door. Mosley proceeded to stab Kitty several more times and assault her sexually, before taking $49 from her and leaving the area. Sophie Farrar, one of Kitty's neighbors, found her after hearing Kitty screaming. The police would not arrive until after 4 a.m. Kitty was in the ambulance at 4.15 a.m. She would die in that ambulance on the way to the hospital. Now looking at the investigation and the trial, police believed that Katie's roommate, Marianne Zialanko, was the best suspect. When they first encountered her, she was with a neighbor named Carl Ross. He had supplied her alcohol and she was drinking. They questioned Marianne for six hours, asking her a number of questions about the couple's sex life. They spoke to many of the neighbors and asked them several questions about her lifestyle as well. The police did not make an arrest. Mosley was arrested on March 19, 1964 for an unrelated robbery he had committed in Ozone Park, Queens. When he was being questioned by the police, they noticed he had scars on his hands and they accused him of killing Kitty Genovese. He would eventually confess to the murder of three women, including Kitty, although later on he would claim that the Mafia killed Kitty Genovese and he was just 
the getaway driver. He was only charged with her murder, not the other two. When the trial began, Mosley pleaded not guilty, but his lawyer changed his plea to not guilty by reason of insanity. He testified that he killed Kitty Genovese and two other women, as well as admitting to a number of other assaults of a sexual nature and burglaries. He was found guilty and sentenced to death. In 1967, Mosley won an appeal because he was not allowed to bring up the insanity defense at a sentencing. His death sentence was changed to life in prison. In prison, Mosley injured himself and was taken to the hospital for minor surgery. After his recovery, when he was being transported from the hospital to the prison, he acted as though he was not feeling well, so the guards did not handcuff him or shackle him. They apparently forgot that sometimes prisoners are known to be deceptive. Mosley escaped by simply running away. He ended up in an empty house, not even 2,000 feet from the hospital. There he found a loaded 45 caliber pistol. His escape could not have gone smoother unless he also found the now discontinued do-it-yourself kit titled Make Your Own Passport Prisoner's Edition. Mosley attacked several people over the next few days before eventually surrendering. He would plead guilty to escape and kidnapping and was given two 15-year sentences that were to run concurrently with the life sentence he was already serving. He would be denied parole 18 times during his prison career. I always picture these parole boards as using a stamp on these applications, like a stamp that says denied in red letters. I think at some point they probably put away the denied stamp and started using the this guy can't take a hint stamp. He would die in prison in 2016 at age 81. Now moving to the bystander effect. This case is really one of the first popular examples of what is now referred to as the bystander effect. But it's interesting how this case really led to that construct. On March 27, 1964, an article appeared in the New York Times titled, 37 who saw murder didn't call the police. The number would later be increased to 38. Later on, information from this article would end up in a book written by the editor of that story named Abraham Rosenthal. The book was titled 38 Witnesses, the Kitty Genovese Case. In February 1993, another notorious murder occurred that highlighted the bystander effect. Two-year-old James Bulger was killed by two 10-year-old boys after they led him around Liverpool, England for over two hours. They encountered 38 bystanders who failed to do anything to intervene, even though they noticed that James was clearly in distress. Now moving to 2007, an article was published revealing that the New York Times article from 1964 was inaccurate. As it turns out, only two of Kitty's neighbors behaved in a way consistent with how the New York Times said that 38 people behaved. There were a number of witnesses, perhaps as many as 33, but it's not clear how much information they really had. Moving to the two that behaved quite badly, the first is Carl Ross. Carl Ross was intoxicated that evening. He heard the first attack, but it wasn't clear at what point he understood what he was hearing was an attack. When he heard the second attack taking place, he opened his door a little bit to see what was going on, and he saw Kitty on the ground. She was attempting to speak to him as Mosley was stabbing her. Carl then closed his door and called a friend, asking that friend what he should do. The friend advised him not to get involved. He then called a second friend who lived in the building. She said, come on over to her apartment. He then climbed out of his window and walked across the roof to get to that neighbor's apartment. That friend called another friend who called the police. Now, some reports say that Carl called the police, but either way, the call didn't take place until 3.50 a.m. Over a half hour had passed since the initial attack. Carl Ross's explanation of his behavior would become a key phrase tied to the bystander effect. I didn't want to get involved. Carl offered nothing further than that explanation. Some people theorized that because Carl Ross was gay, he was afraid to call the police because homosexuality was illegal in New York City at that time. The other witness who failed to act appropriately was named Joseph Fink. He witnessed the first attack and he saw Winston Mosley flee after Robert Moser yelled at Mosley. And then he went into his basement to sleep rather than going outside to help Kitty Genovese. There were some other factors that may have delayed the police as well. 
Other people claim they actually did call the police, but they didn't take it seriously. It's really hard to know at this point. The Kitty Genovese case led to the emergency 911 system, with 911 becoming the national emergency number in 1968. Now, what's interesting about the bystander effect is that it has repeatedly held up in a number of experiments, even though the case of Kitty Genovese, which led to the effect being studied in the first place, wasn't necessarily the best example available of the bystander effect. There were two witnesses who didn't do what they should have done, and one who helped, but not enough. That's far short of a crowd of onlookers who see each other and decide they don't have to do anything because somebody else may do something. When something like this does happen, it is known as a diffusion of responsibility. Nobody feels like they need to do anything because somebody else will take care of it. And of course, with that type of thinking, nobody does anything. What I find so interesting about the fraudulent reporting in that New York Times article is that when people read the article about, at that time, 37 witnesses, they immediately started to try to figure out how that could have happened rather than challenging the accuracy of the story. Again, that wouldn't occur until about 40 years later. Based on this, I think it stands to reason that people are willing to believe that the flawed nature of the human condition could lead to many people failing to help somebody who's being murdered, more so than a flawed nature could lead to somebody lying to make a story more sensational. Which one really is more improbable? Even with this dispute about the accuracy of the story, the bystander effect does remain one of the more frightening social behavior constructs. How is it that people could be so indifferent and callous as to witness somebody being attacked and do absolutely nothing? What is the remedy to the bystander effect? Well, trying to be attacked when only one or two witnesses are present doesn't seem like a good plan. Sadly, I think the lesson here with the bystander effect is that people can't depend on others, which is fairly sad. This was such a tragic case. Kitty Genovese did everything she could possibly do to defend herself as well as encourage other people to assist her. The witnesses needed to step up and help her, but they failed her in every possible way. Those are my thoughts on the Kitty Genovese case and the bystander effect. Please put any thoughts and opinions in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be interesting. Thanks for watching. I think at some point they probably put away the denied stamp and started using the read between the lines stamp and started using the you miss this by a mile stamp and started using the stop wasting our time stamp and started using the don't you understand the meaning of the word formality and started using the you'll get paroled when unicorns and flying pigs are playing ice hockey in hell stamp. This one isn't used too often because it consumes a lot of red ink.